This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Githu Ewart. It's Tuesday, February 11th. This is Africa 54. Sudan agrees to hand ex-president Omar al-Bashir to the International Criminal Court. Nigerian Justice Minister Abubakar Malami discusses U.S. visa restrictions taking effect later this month. And how the continent is preparing for a possible outbreak of the coronavirus. Tonight, we begin with a major development out of Sudan. The country's transitional government has agreed to turn over former President Omar al-Bashir to the International Criminal Court. News of the decision came Tuesday after meetings in South Sudan's capital, Juba, between the Sudanese government and rebel groups from Sudan's Darfur region. Speaking to VOA, Ahmed Tugud, a representative of the rebel justice and equality movement, says the sides agreed all four Sudanese nationals indicted by the ICC will be turned over to the Hague-based court for trial, including Bashir. Too Good says the agreement for handing them over will not go into effect until there is a full peace agreement with the warring parties in Sudan. He says he expects that to happen within the next few weeks. The Sudan News Agency reports the government and Darfur rebel groups have agreed the ICC arrest warrant are key to achieving justice in Darfur, where rebels have fought the Sudanese government since 2003. The SNA report did not mention Bashir by name. Now, Bashir is wanted by the ICC on charges of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. ICC prosecutors say Bashir tried to destroy civilian populations in Darfur through a campaign of murder, rape, pillaging and other crimes. He was ousted by Sudan's military in April 2019 after 30 years of rule. For more discussion on the story, joining me is John Tanza, Managing Editor of VOA South Sudan in Focus Radio Program. John, welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you, Esther. It's a pleasure now, to be here. Sure. Now, what does this announcement mean for uh, Bashir and actually for the people of Sudan as well as the ICC? It's a mixed reaction. For the people of Sudan, you have to take it along party lines. Of course, supporters of Bashir will fight to the end so that Bashir is not taken to ICC. But supporters of the military council, the new government in Sudan, are greeting this with happiness, especially people from Darfur, because uh, since the war started in 2003, the people of Darfur have pointed fingers at Bashir for commanding responsibility. He was the commander in chief of the army. So they said, whatever happened in Darfur, he bears full responsibility. And the ICC has been waiting for him for quite a long time. They, they, they've issued arrest, arrest warrant. Bashir has been moving from one country to another. And nobody has arrested him. This comes as a welcoming news to the ICC. Now, I'm curious. Do we know why they did not mention al-Bashir by name in that statement? It's a tricky situation here in Sudan. The, the, the Supreme Council that is now the ruling body in Sudan is not quite certain about Bashir's loyalist, where they are, what they are planning. And you know, he has been there for 30 years in charge of the army. His supporters are there in the army. And it, it's a diplomatic move. They don't want to mention his name to avoid a backlash. Yeah. Now, do we know if the transitional government has been under pressure to hand over Bashir to ICC? What are you hearing from political analysts? The, the transitional government has been trying its best to mend fences with the international communities, more so with the United States. Uh, Prime Minister Hamdok came here twice, and uh, Burhan has been invited by the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to come to the United States. So the focus for the Sudanese government right now is to mend their fences with the U.S. government, and then they want the economic sanctions to be lifted. They want their names to be removed from list of countries sponsoring terrorism. So certain moves have connections with that. I know you've been, stayed on top of this story since we had the news just about uh, two hours ago now. Uh, 
have you heard of any reactions from the supporters of Al Bashir? Because we saw not long ago the kind of shooting that you know happened in intelligence buildings in Sudan, and we do know, like you said, he does have supporters. Yeah, the reactions are mute from Khartoum as of now, but definitely from tomorrow moving forward, there will be reaction. There is a report that Bashir's uh, lawyer made statements that Bashir is not going to accept this uh, decision by the opposition groups and the, the Supreme Council. So that's, that's one reaction. Do you think there was any reason why this announcement was made in Juba and not in Khartoum? Well, it was made in Juba specifically because the government of South Sudan mediated, has been mediating talks between the Supreme Council and the op various opposition groups uh, in Sudan, specifically the rebel groups in Darfur, Southern Kordofan, and the Blue Niles. So this decision was reached during some of the agreements that the, the, the groups have signed. Things change because we've had the South Sudanese going to Khartoum to discuss their own political issues. Well, John. the two countries <laughs> depend on each other. South yes. Sudan cannot do without Sudan. Sudan cannot do with South Sudan because of their economic ties, of their links. So the two need each other. Right. Thank you so much, John, for your insight. My pleasure. Right. My pleasure. John Tanza is the managing editor of VOA South Sudan in Focus program. Now, tens of thousands of people turned out in Nairobi to watch Kenya's second president, Daniel Arap Moy's coffin draped in the Kenyan flag, travel on a gun carriage from the State House to an open air stadium just three miles away. Personnel from the Army, Air Force, and Navy accompanied the coffin into the stadium where choirs sang gospel songs as they awaited the procession. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta told mourners, quote, as an avid peacemaker, statesman, an Africanist, and champion for a more united and just world, Moi spearheaded a number of initiatives that brought peace within our region and beyond. Tuesday was declared a public holiday, allowing people to mourn Moi's passing. Moi rose to power in 1978 as vice president, following the death of the nation's first president, Jomo Kenyatta. Moy will be buried Wednesday at his Kabarak home in Kenya's Rift Valley region. The founder of South Africa's male a cappella group, Ladysmith Black Mambazo Joseph Shabalala, has died at the age of 78, according to the government and the South African Broadcasting Corporation. The Grammy Award winning group provided backup harmonies to Paul Simon's 1986 Graceland album introducing their African indigenous music to a global audience with the songs Homeless. During their career, they also worked with superstars Stevie Wonder and Dolly Parton. Shabalala founded the prolific group in Ladysmith along the east coast of South Africa in the 1960s at the height of white minority apartheid rule. According to the group's website, the black in their name was a reference to strong oxen and Shabalala's early life on a farm, while the word Mambazo is the Zulu word for a chopping axe, a symbol of the group's vocal power. Nigerian Justice Minister Abubakar Malami says his government is working with the White House to ease concerns about immigration that landed Nigeria on a list of countries facing new U.S. visa restrictions that take effect later this month. Malami was in Washington for talks at the State Department and spoke with VOA's Peter Claudie about the new visa restrictions. If indeed there, there is any concern being expressed by the American government relating to visas, it has to do with the activities of the migrants, perhaps maybe human trafficking issues, perhaps maybe uh, illegal migration and associated things. So it is a limited um, um, a, a limited context policy mm -hmm. and not a general policy relating to movement of Nigerians and indeed visas associated with Nigerians. Justice Minister Malami says the Buhari administration is determined to improve Nigerian security. Whatever it takes in terms of uh, legislation, in terms of policy, in terms of international collaboration, in terms of training associated things for the purpose of enhancing and the security situation, I think we are taking steps with particular regard to globalization of security as an issue, with particular regard to uh, politicization of, of same, 
and indeed with uh, further regard to uh, commercialization of that. So that is why, by way of legislations, for example, locally, we have um, uh, legislations that have to do with financial intelligence, and we have institutions that are saddled with the responsibilities that are burdened in terms of checkmating the cyber crimes, in terms of checkmating the uh, terrorist funding activities and associated things. Nigerian officials were in Washington as part of a team to recover more than $300 million taken by former ruler Sani Abacha. Justice Minister Malami says the repatriation of the stolen funds is a vote of confidence in Buhari administration transparency. But the good thing about it is um, this other repatriation process is indeed establishes a point that international community are indeed developing confidence in the Nigerian system as it relates, one, to the process of repatriation, and then two, the application of the funds in a transparent and accountable way and manner, taking into consideration that the $322 million that were earlier on repatriated from Switzerland to Nigeria were indeed judiciously and effectively applied for the purpose for which it was meant to be applied, which is social investment program. And indeed, uh, under the uh, monitoring of the World Bank and supervision of the civil society organizations. So it establishes a point that Nigeria, as a gov uh, the government of Nigeria, it had indeed imbibed the culture of transparency, accountability, and indeed working together by way of collaboration for the purpose of ensuring expeditious repatriations of looted assets. That was Nigerian Justice Minister Abubakar Malami speaking with our Peter Claudi. In Kenya's northeast Boni Forest, on the border with Somalia, schools that were closed for five years after Al-Shabaab terrorist attacks have reopened. But many children are still unable to attend, as few teachers are willing to work in the area. Mohamed Yusuf reports from Kiangwe. Kiangwe village is the gateway to Boni Forest from where Al-Shabaab terrorists launched attacks in 2015 that forced area schools to close. Kiangwe Primary School was among five that shut their doors, forcing children to travel long distances, homeschool or get no education. But all the schools reopened for the first time in January for early childhood development classes. We have greatly improved the security. We have also deployed the teachers in those schools. We have a head teacher and a classroom teacher. We have VCD teachers in those schools. So the schools are running normally. We have also provided resources, books and everything. But while Kiangwe Primary School resumed classes, authorities say the fear of Al-Shabaab attacks means few teachers are willing to return. So they had to cut the number of classes in half. There are insecurities in our school. We enhance security, but we don't have enough teachers. There's only one teacher per so many students. Parents in this remote and poor area of Kenya worry that if not enough teachers are found, their children's education will come to a halt. Zainab Bakari's son should have started grade 8 this semester. <laughs> Here, we've only got school up to fourth grade. I don't have the fare to send him out. It's my loss. I am at a loss. Farid Sadiq is one of only two teachers at the school. We feel there's, a, 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 there's something to be done to the community because we were trained as teachers and they were trained to work anywhere in the public. Families can only hope the improved security will attract more teachers so all the children can get back to school after such a long break. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Kiangwe, Kenya. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines. 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, the continent braces for the coronavirus. We'll be right back.
hi, 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 you just hi, hi, hi. Nina uka ni luka buseni, na chingwe uka pena ni malaria. Make you my woman. I don't wanna waste no time. I say all of all of my mama. You know I'm wanting you. I say all of all of my mama. Can I be the one for you? Tell me where did you come from? I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. In Nigeria, the carnivore is king. The consumption of meat is a status symbol. Activists say Nigerians are becoming more health conscious. Violent clashes between herders and farmers in central Nigeria are drawing attention to the impact of beef production and entrepreneurs. Veggie Victory is Nigeria's first vegan food company. It also produces a soy-based meat alternative called Vegetarian Chunks, designed to mimic local favorites such as suya, a spicy Nigerian barbecue, and enkwobe, a dish usually made with cow leg. Next up, discarded bottles and plastic bags litter the streets of Tokyo. Now one startup has found a practical way to help people avoid plastic waste. Maimizu, has launched an app to help users find water fountains, cafes and restaurants that are willing to refill reusable bottles for free. The app finds the nearest spot and gives directions. It went live last September, but a new version, made in collaboration with Aoi Japan, launched last month. It means users can now monitor the impact of all their refills. And finally, the fashion industry was found to be the second most polluting industry in the world by the UN Conference on Trade and Development. So buying fewer new clothes made it onto many people's New Year's resolution list for 2020. And rental platforms are now gaining popularity as a result. Now even the world-famous Selfridges department store has opened its first permanent space for pre-owned designer clothes. Those who wish to sell can simply bring their used goods to a drop-off point at the store. It also makes it easier for customers to buy and sell luxury items. And that's what's trending today. In U.S. election news, heading into Tuesday's New Hampshire primary, polls showed Vermont Senator Benny Sanders leading the field in New Hampshire, followed by former South Bend Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Battling for the third place are Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and former Vice President Joe Biden. VOS Jim Malone has a preview from Washington. Yeah, how fun. You guys are all warm. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar makes her pitch to voters at a diner in New Hampshire, hoping to surprise with a strong finish. Also among those making a late appeal for support is the man leading in the polls, Senator Bernie Sanders. Now is the time to get involved. Please come out on Tuesday. Let's win here. Let's defeat Trump. Let's transform this country. Thank you all, Claremont. Sanders is trying to hold off a surge from Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg edged out Sanders in the delegate count in last week's Iowa caucuses and now warns voters that Sanders would be a divisive Democratic nominee. The idea that you've either got to be for a revolution or you got to be for the status quo leaves most of us out. We need a politics that brings all of us in because all of us need a new and better president. New Hampshire looms as a crucial test for Joe Biden. After leading in national polls all of last year, Biden came in a disappointing fourth in Iowa and is looking for ways to revitalize his flagging campaign. The character of this country is on the ballot. We must defeat Donald Trump. There is no choice. 
The man has a, not a shred of decency. Biden appears to be battling for third place with Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. Talk to the person in front of you in line at the grocery store, but most of all, get in this fight. Other candidates looking to make a mark in New Hampshire include Klobuchar, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, and Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Voters in New Hampshire seem most concerned with finding the strongest candidate to take on President Trump, says Jim Kessler. We do have an electorate that is still searching for a candidate. A lot of voters are saying there are two or three candidates that I could support. Michael Bloomberg is out there with unlimited resources once we get past the first four states, so surprises could still happen. After New Hampshire, the Democratic candidates will take their campaigns to more demographically diverse states like Nevada and South Carolina. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Now, as voters in New Hampshire cast their ballot Tuesday in the Democratic primary, VOA's Caroline Presuti is standing by live in Concord, New Hampshire. Hello, Caroline. It's an all-out scramble for votes in New Hampshire. How's the turnout? Well, Carolyn, which is just steps away from the state capitol building here. We have not sure if Caroline can hear me. All right. We'll be back shortly. All right, it's time for a health report, and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mundu with a coronavirus update. Hello, Lino. Hello, Esther. Hello, everyone. The World Health Organization says death from the coronavirus epidemic have surpassed 1,000. The development comes as some 300 scientists, public health agencies, ministries of health and research funders convene for an expert two-day meeting at the WHO to share the latest information about the virus and decide how best to confront it. According to the WHO, there is no vaccine to protect against the disease and no proven therapeutics to infections. China is reporting over 42,000 confirmed cases. During a visit with coronavirus patients at a Beijing hospital Monday, President Xi Jinping called for more decisive measures to contain the outbreak. China's central bank is making $43 billion available to help businesses involved in fighting the epidemic. Health experts say the spread of the coronavirus may ease in warm weather when people get out of doors and are not in such close contact with each other. But this is a new strain of coronavirus, and some of the experts believe it is not too soon to say if spring and summer will kill it off. Now, health authorities in Africa are scrambling to prepare for a potential outbreak of the coronavirus. In South Africa, health officials say the country is taking preventive steps to ensure that the virus does not become a national threat. Professor Cheryl Cohen, co-head of the Center for Respiratory Disease and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in South Africa, explains. In South Africa, really, we are, are, have been closely monitoring the situation right from the first uh, small reports of cases in Wuhan. And, and really, we've seen the evolution of this to, to be really a global um, situation. And, um, of course, uh, you know, as part of that, we've been really uh, stepping up our preparedness in the event of an outbreak. And really, the first thing we did was, was issue guidance uh, to clinicians um, in terms of what is the case definition and what are the signs and symptoms to look out for. And then, you know, really having practical processes for, for isolation of cases, treatment of cases and guidance on making the diagnosis. And also as part of that, you know, really strengthening the surveillance at the ports of entry, which we know is not is not a hundred percent. People can be incubating and still come into the country, but but that's also an important part to, part to try and collect or identify cases early. I think another really important part for South Africa was was getting our laboratory up and running to to do the diagnostic test. And and obviously in the early stages of of an outbreak like this with a completely new virus, the, you know, there aren't just tests that you can buy 
off the shelf. Uh, we were very fortunate that, that uh, some laboratories quite early developed the test and published that test. So they made the procedures available. And then our lab worked really hard, um, you know, overnights and weekends to, to get that protocol and then to procure the reagents and validate the assay in our laboratory. And, and I think it's really helpful that we have this assay running in country so that we can provide a rapid diagnosis and exclude, um, you know, possible cases, um, which is really helpful. That's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter, at Lenormodu. Esther? Great reporting as usual, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, be sure to watch Lenormodu's health report every Tuesday on Africa 54. Now let's get back to uh, New Hampshire where voters in that uh, place are casting their ballots Tuesday in the Democratic primary. VOA's Caroline Presuti is standing by live in Concord, New Hampshire. Hello, Caroline. It's an all-out scramble, as I said, for votes in New Hampshire. Tell us how the voter turnout has been like. Esther, it certainly is a scramble to get your votes in here, and it was a scramble for the candidates, too, to have their last-minute push for votes last night. Here at the polling place in Concord, New Hampshire, we've seen a steady stream, slow but steady, of the voters coming in. I spoke with one of the older uh, election officials here. He said this is many more than there were four years ago for that uh, presidential election. Um, so when they come in, they, they get a paper ballot, then they go into a booth, um, and then their vote is counted electronically into a machine that is hardwired in the wall. So it's not connected with Bluetooth. It's not connect connected electronically, the results, I mean. Um, and so, therefore, they say that they will have no glitch mm -hmm. like we experienced in Iowa last week. So um, have, you've spoken to some of the voters that have already cast their ballots. What are they telling you? Well, one woman, I asked her about the number because uh, there are 33 Democratic candidates on this ballot. And on the Republican ballot, there are 17. So basically, they're deciding between 50 people who should be the nominee for the Democratic Party and, um, and if someone else uh, should uh, be the nominee for the Republican Party. But of course, we all know that that will definitely be Donald Trump. When I asked this lady about her vote, she said, it was very confusing. There were so many on the ballot, but I found the one I liked. And it seems like even though they come in as an undecided voter, they feel strongly about whom they voted for on their way out. And maybe 30 seconds, Caroline, where and what are the candidates doing right now? The candidates are still visiting different polling places. They're meeting and greeting people outside the polling places. I think Pete Buttigieg receives the award for the, the one who was up the earliest. At 6 a.m., he was out at a polling place, and it didn't even open until 7. So he was shaking hands to convince people to vote for him. Right. And one candidate, though, Tom right, Steyer, left the state. <laughs> so he's on to uh, yeah. another location. For All another right, Caroline, we're running out. So thank you so much, Caroline Pursuti, reporting live for us from Concord, New Hampshire. And that's our show for today. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for watching Africa 54.